I am so tired of hearing public land hunters tell me they're gonna do whatever they want to do on public land. It's their right, legal to do this, legal to do that, so they're gonna do it. All right, I get it. But it's also legal to go into a fancy restaurant and bust a big ass fart in the middle of dinner. There is an unwritten code when it comes to sharing public land with other hunters, outfitters, their clients, anybody else out there while you're hunting. And if you follow those rules, it works out a whole lot better for you and it works out a whole lot better for everybody else out there with you. If you have no clue who I am, I don't blame you at all. My name's Cliff Gray. I guided in some of the most remote wilderness in North America for the past decade. I've dealt with thousands of hunters over that period of time and the experiences and thoughts that I share in these videos is just based on that data set. I hope it helps you guys on your hunts. If you do get value from these videos, please do me a huge favor and like the videos and subscribe to the channel. So first I'm gonna go over some baseline rules, but at the end of the video, I'm gonna give you some insight on how outfitters generally view public land hunters and that insight will allow you to get the most out of an area that's heavily hunted by outfitters. All right, so the first straightforward rule when it comes to public land hunting, whoever draws first blood on an animal, it's their animal. There really are no exceptions to this rule. Unfortunately, this happens quite a bit, particularly in late season elk hunting. When elk get pushed in to concentrated areas, sometimes multiple hunting groups will end up stalking animals, a lot of times unintentionally. What happens is, particularly on elk, they can get hit and then they can look like they're not hit. And then other hunters will also take shot opportunities at them as those elk move, you know, maybe closer to them. The problem is sometimes there's arguments about whose animal that is. And the baseline rule is that first blood takes the animal. Even if it's just a flesh wound, that's still the rule. There's no point in taking this rule that really doesn't have any gray area in creating it, all right? Don't try to justify that that's your elk because it was going to survive after that first person shot it. You shot it to save the day and you mortally wounded an elk that would otherwise never have been found by the first hunter. That logic complicates a situation that shouldn't be that complicated. Obviously, sometimes there are times where just the first hunter decides, hey man, like you can take the elk. It looks like I, I hit it very poorly or just barely on my first shot. You know, I should have taken a better shot. You know, that was my mistake. You can take the animal. A lot of hunters will do that, but you have to apply the rule if there's any conflict at all. First blood, it's their animal. I do think in this rule, there's an opportunity to really affect young hunters' lives. There's been several situations that I've run into the, over the years where one hunter wounds an animal and then it trails off and then it runs into another group of hunters and there's a young hunter in that group and they shoot that wounded animal and then they're very excited because they believe they have harvested, say, their first cow elk or their first bull elk and then they go up to the animal and then the original hunter follows up and then there's kind of a weird, awkward situation you're doing the hunting world a huge favor if you let that second hunter, the young hunter or beginner hunter take that animal. All right, so the second pretty much no gray area rule, if somebody beats you to a glassing point, go somewhere else. If you go into a glassing spot and there's somebody at the glassing spot and they've got the advantageous spot there to see the country and it's obvious where they're going to be glassing from that spot, you need to go to another spot where you're glassing somewhere else, okay? That doesn't mean sit down 300 yards below them at a lower elevation and glass the same country. You need to bite the bullet, pack your shit up, and as quick as possible, go to a new spot where you're glassing new country. If you don't do that, all you're doing is asking for future conflict, right? They're gonna glass up the same animals as you. And that's part of the reason why I talk about this concept in a lot of my elk hunting preparation videos. I'll stick one of those videos up right here. I talk about the concept that you have to have glassing point A, backup plan B, backup plan C. All right, so rule number three, if somebody else is stalking an animal, and I know there's gonna be some commentary on this one, like, well, when do I know they're stalking the animal? When do I know they're stalking the animal that I'm looking at? Those are all bullshit excuses. If you have a little experience in the field, or if you just look at the mannerisms of other hunters out there on public land, you're gonna know if they're traveling to a new spot, if they're sitting glassing patiently, or they're stalking an animal. Claiming otherwise is total bullshit and you're just self-serving in the way to essentially break this rule. If somebody else is stalking an animal for that moment, best thing to do is let them stalk that animal on their own 
and it's their game at that point. But there's a couple things you can do. It's very appropriate to look at the situation where could you get a potential shot opportunity that that hunter is not going to have, but is gonna occur because the animal gets boogered by the stock. And this is easy to do. Just look at the obvious exit points, right? If you're in a drainage and there's certain shoots the animal is gonna come out of, go get in a position where you can take advantage of the situation where the stock doesn't work. I can tell you from observing probably a thousand plus stocks out on public land, my best guess is that at least two thirds of them do not result in a shot opportunity for the folks stalking the animal. That means that if you're in this situation and you're in second place they're stalking and you're observing you pretty much have the same opportunity to kill that animal as they do as long as you're careful about choosing where to go and take advantage of the scenario where they don't get a shot off the vast majority of public land hunters should not be shooting at mule deer elk or other big game species in the mountains at further than 300 or 400 yards. And luckily, the majority of them know that. So when they're doing stocks, they're trying to get into that sub 400 yard range. But now you have a lot of folks that are participating in long range shooting. When it comes to competent long range shooters, I don't have a strong opinion about this either way. If they can take animals at ethical distances that are much further than your average hunter, fine, that's that's you know that's their prerogative and that's what they enjoy doing. But when it comes to this rule, it makes it a little bit of a gray area. If there's somebody below you stalking an animal and they're at 600 yards and they've got to cover another 200 yards before they really have a shot opportunity, but you're at 900 yards or 1,000 yards and you think or you know that you're competent at harvesting animals at that distance in the current conditions, are you breaking this rule if you take the shot now really without a stop? In my opinion, and I would say the opinion of the vast majority of experienced folks out there, if you do that, you're a dick. Okay, so the next rule, let's call it rule four, but it's really related to number three. If somebody is actively calling an animal or they're into some elk and it's very clear that they have a calling setup going, and this could apply to other calling situations too, turkey hunting on public land, all of those different situations, if somebody's actively set up on an animal, the fairest thing to do is stay clear of that situation. Again, just like the stalking scenario, you can observe that and you can figure out ways to benefit from that. And it's very appropriate to do that if you're not messing up their calling situation directly. So let me give you a solid example so you kind of see my perspective on this because this can be a little bit of a gray area. If you hear an individual cow calling or bugling to a bull and that bull is vocalizing back to the hunter, the first thing I would look at is what if this bull does the exact opposite of what that hunter wants the bull to do? And that tends to be the case with a lot of calling situations. The bull does what you want to do or it'll do the exact opposite, right? It'll sense that something's wrong, something's not quite right. If the bull's got cows, this is even more the case because there's more animals to sense that something's just not right. They'll go the other direction or they'll mosey to an exit path, that sort of thing. So what you can do is you can set yourself up for success and consider those exit paths and you can go in there and maybe even set up so you can do your own calling if the animal starts to move that way. But don't go try to interject yourself between the bull and the hunter that is already having vocalizations back and forth. That, in my mind, is against the whole public land hunting code. All right, so rule number five, this is gonna mainly apply to wilderness hunting, you know, pack-in hunting, you know, elk and deer out west, those type of hunts, maybe spring bear where you're going into remote areas and you're camping. One unspoken rule that nobody directly says, but everybody seems to know it and acknowledge it, at least if they've been out hunting quite a bit, this is for sure the case amongst the outfitting community, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but do not camp where you can see another camp or you can hear another camp. You can backpack into a drainage four or five miles and be totally tired and get to the spot that you planned and there's another camp in that location. This means that the right thing to do in that situation is to put out the extra effort and find another location where you don't visually see that camp and that camp's not gonna hear you and you're not gonna hear that camp. That's the unwritten rule when it comes to camping. I can't tell you how many times, and, and, I'll, and I'll be totally transparent, I felt this way deeply. If I went into one of my outfitting camps and some public land hunter had decided to put their backpack tent up within visual distance of my camp, that would piss me off. And in my mind, I viewed it as they were breaking 
a code of the wilderness or a code of public land hunting. Again, some of you guys are going to disagree with this. Feel free to comment about it and give me your logic below. I'd love to hear about it. Love to hear your perspective. And at the end of this video, I'll give you some details on outfitting that put some context around this. It'll give you a better idea of why outfitters get so annoyed by this, but we'll save that for later. Okay, rule number six, be hunting or glassing during prime time. Do not be moving, if at all possible. If you do have to move during prime time hours, it is your obligation to avoid ruining other folks hunt. Best scenario is just don't do it. Always move in the dark, outside of shooting light, or midday when the, when the animals are bedded down. That's when you should be doing your logistics. The worst thing you can do and the best way to piss off other hunters is to start moving around when they're already at their glassing points, they're already still hunting, they're already on stocks during prime feeding hours of game animals. This is a rule that new hunters or naive hunters break all the time and they don't realize how much it irks other hunters. All right, so some people are gonna say, why would I follow these rules? I don't give a shit about other people. I'm just there to hunt and enjoy public land on my own accord. Well, here's the deal. Even if you're just a pecker head, I'm gonna give you some reasons why it makes sense to follow these rules just for your own benefit. The first idea that is very prevalent up in the mountains is just the idea of reciprocity. If you're a good neighbor to other public land hunters, they're much more willing to help you when they interact with you. In one sense, they're much more likely to abide by the same set of rules for your benefit when that situation arises. The second thing is, in public land hunting, there's a lot of ways that hunters can help other hunters at no cost to themselves, right? A couple concrete examples would be, hey, I'm glassing across this drainage that's two miles wide, and I'm looking at another hunter's camp, and I see elk bedded down by that camp, right? And logistically, it's just very difficult for me to go over and try to harvest one of those elk, but I have that knowledge in my mind. There on that side of the drainage, they have no clue that those elk are down in there. Well, three days later, at the head of the drainage, I run into one of the hunters from that camp. If they've been good neighbors and they haven't caused me problems and they've abided by these rules, I'm much more likely to give them that information. Why not? It's not a big cost to me, so I'm more likely to give them that information. If they haven't abided by these rules and they've done things that have annoyed me or cost me opportunity, I might just keep that information to myself. The other situation that arises a lot between public land hunters, you're going into an area when they're leaving an area. A lot of times the group that's leaving and they've already been hunting for you know six or seven days and you've overlapped with them for two or three days, if you've been good neighbors to them, a lot of times they're willing to transfer information to you as you leave, right? They'll tell you where, hey, we saw some elk here. The last day we saw some elk here. That information can be invaluable if you still have three or four days on your hunt. All right, so the subject that a lot of you have probably been waiting for. What do outfitters really think about public land hunters? I don't think it's what you think. Outfitters, they do not view public land hunters as competition. Okay. I was generally never worried that a public land hunter was going to kill a deer or kill an elk that I would rather one of my clients killed, right? There wasn't that type of competition. I was always much more concerned about a public land hunter affecting the experience of one of my clients. That's much more relevant. The reason it's important for public land hunters to understand this feeling from outfitters is it opens up opportunity for there to be a cordial relationship. And a huge trick here, if you're hunting in areas that are heavily outfitted, is if you know this and you understand this concept and you go out of your way to not affect the outfitter's client's experience, that outfitter a lot of times will all of a sudden be very helpful to you. Okay, so what does that look like? The first thing is just apply the seven rules that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Most outfitters will appreciate that. A couple things to emphasize though. The camp location one is huge. And the thing that most people out there don't understand is that outfitters can't move their camps. There's two reasons for that. One, just the logistics of moving wall tent camps around can be pretty intense. You, you know, it could take them two, three days to move one of those big camps. The other reason is actually a legal reason. Usually there's permitting for those camps in specific areas. So if you camp within visual distance of an outfitter's camp or within audible distance of an outfitter's camp, you're affecting his client's experience 
big time and you're gonna irk that outfitter all right so if you put a little effort in that you're gonna avoid that situation usually it's not that hard to do right it can be frustrating that you go into good areas and good camp locations and there's outfitter camps there but if you do a little effort particularly if you're just backpack hunting it's easy to just get up on a bench put your backpack tent in there and have a little quiet spot you'll find another water source that sort of thing it's usually easy to do that but the payoff in terms of relationships can be huge the other thing with outfitters if you're in an area with outfitters that are using horses and mules it'll benefit you if you know how to deal with the situation when you run into them on the trail the best thing to do if you run into a guide that's got horses and mules and this goes for other public hunters that have stock too it's not just an outfitter thing but outfitters just have to deal with it a little bit more because a lot of times they're using more animals in the wilderness but the thing to do so move off the trail but stay where the animals can see you right where the pack animals and the, and the riding horses can visually see you and try to have a low you know quiet conversation with the wrangler or guide that's coming down the trail that's the best situation for you and in addition to that don't move rapidly don't move in erratic movements just try to keep it easy sometimes people are nervous around horses and mules on the trail but the best thing to do don't make rapid movements don't hide that's one of the worst things you can do stay visual where the stock can see you and have a mellow conversation with whoever is there outfitters and guides will appreciate that great greatly. I can tell you that there's several situations where I ran into people that were very polite and cognizant of the stock on the trail situation. And later on, I came through and I saw that they had an animal down. I had em empty panniers and I just threw it in there and packed the animal out for them. Saved them 500 bucks, 600 bucks, or saved them a day and a half of packing the meat out on their back. And that goes back to the sense of reciprocity. You're doing me a favor by knowing and understanding that, hey, this is a big deal. And just so, just so you guys understand, that's usually a really big deal to outfitters because they know what they're doing but somebody they don't control, a public land hunter, a backpack hunter on the side of the trail who's erratic or jumpy and scares their string of horses, that can ruin the outfitter's day, can get people severely hurt. There's a lot of big risk there. So if you're showing them that you're cognizant of that and you're making an effort to, to avoid problems with them, that'll get you a ton of brownie points with them. The nice thing to know is that it's not that hard for a public land hunter to help an outfitter out. It's, you know, it's pretty close to costless. And the nice thing about that relationship is that an outfitter in a lot of scenarios they can help a public land hunter and it can be pretty much costless to them so if there's a good relationship there both parties generally are happier i hope you got value from this video if you did do me a huge favor and like it and subscribe to the channel thanks for watching and good luck out there i'll see you next time